This is an interview of Les Levine at Jeu de Pomme in Paris on July 19, 2018, through the exhibition of Gordon Mata Clark, an architect. Gordon Mata Clark and Les Levine were close friends. In front of a clock, uh -huh. kind of a Harold Lloyd uh, movie. The title is Clock Shower. Yeah, yeah because this is in, in the clock tower. Okay, the, the clock tower in New York, which at a certain point during the uh, 80s and what have you was a place, kind of an alternative space, which was run by uh, Alana Heiss, R ran it before she ran PS1, she ran the clock tower, and okay. various artists, you know, myself included, mm -hmm. were asked to do pieces, and Gordon decided to do this, I guess. It has to do with the idea that the clock tower was an alternative space during that period. Okay. And, you know, when you were asked to do a piece, as I was at some point, and mm -hmm. other people were at some point, you interacted with the place in the way that you wanted to. I guess he saw the clock as the main thing he should interact with. I mean, I am blessed with the ability to lose memory. <laughs> <laughs> so... Fortunately, I don't have to, uh, you know, go over the past too much. I can think about the future. As the first artist to use billboards in art mm -hmm. history, uh, how do you see uh, the way uh, of using billboards on walls like, like it is done? It, it, it is just uh, maybe... You it's an, an entirely different activity. It is? Yeah, yes. To come and watch it's, this watch. is more related to graffiti. This is more related to putting something up in an area where such a thing would never be. Okay. And, uh, with my work, and I don't want to get into talking about my work too much, but it's always in a place where billboards normally are, as opposed mm -hmm. to putting it up in a place where okay. they wouldn't be. Okay. So, so there is always that element in Gordon's work, you know, some pressure against the norm, some idea of taking space that is not, you know, how is this any different, as example, than graffiti? It's not the normal idea of, uh, let's say, the stylized graffiti. My work is in using the corporate system of advertising. It is, has nothing to do with the idea of putting up information in a place where information should not be. It has nothing to do with imposing a certain kind of information on the community in a way that is random or, uh, you know, vandalized or anything. There is the element within Gordon's work which is uh, anarchistic. And, and so therefore putting up words in places like that are part of this kind of like uh, perverse idea towards anarchy. Mm. Whereas this doesn't right. exist in mm -hmm. my work. Mm -hmm. I actually purchased the space that I put the billboards up in. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I actually have a contract before yeah. I do it. So it's an entirely different sure. activity. It's if, if you had to think about it, while this is a form of imposing or vandalizing, etc. and so forth, mine is kind of it has like... It's never been that, actually. Uh, more in the realm of mm -hmm. corporate conceptualism. <laughs> the reason artists are any good at anything is because they're not part of society. Mm -hmm. And they don't fit in. Artists, to me, are outsiders. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. I mean, right. uh, if they fit it in, I mean, of course, today, given that you have all these museums that require all these uh, people, they must get audience or what have you, mm -hmm. they now want artists to be sort of like suburban gentlemen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Artists are mm -hmm. always outside the norm. Yes. And okay. why is that interesting? Because you don't find invention or creativity within the norm. The idea, initially, 
Um, of course, nothing is shocking to anybody anymore because everything has been normalized, so to speak. But the idea that an artist is behaving like a corporation was an entirely shocking idea mm -hmm. during the period when I first did it. Because this, how could this possibly be? In, in the time when I started doing that, artists were not seen as fitting in and being like suburban gentlemen. They were seen as errant children at that period. So how could an errant child decide to become uh, behaving like a corporation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so right. do you think uh, Gordon was an errant child? Uh, in terms of the way I'm using it, yes. Okay. But in a good way. Okay. I think that Gordon's position was sort of like what I said, artist is an outsider. Artist never fits in to the thing. And so most of the idea that he was dealing with is, you know, opposed to the general uh, trend of the way things are supposed to be done. I mean, if you, if you take the word perversity, I think you'll be, you'll be on the right track with Gordon. Most of his work is in perverse opposition to the status quo. You know, I mean, as I said before, he embraces graffiti. Well, at the period in time, what is graffiti? Uh, it seems to me that graffiti is a form of low-class media. It's the attempt of a certain level of society to try and get information about themselves into the community as opposed to the so-called corporate information which is poured into them. So, and so there is a certain kind of anarchistic aggression involved in that. But, uh, you know, as, as I said before, the gesture of doing that is more important than the aesthetic of how it looks. The way it looks doesn't, in actual fact, count for much because you can't sort of a judge it aesthetically. You know, if, if your name is John, is John more interesting than Jack? Because that's what it's about. It's not about the aesthetics, it's about the tag. It's about the idea that I'm taking something which is in the community and I'm putting my tag on it. Okay? I want people to know me. I don't want them to know that. That was when you, uh, yeah. you said this is really the yeah. This Gordon this, this is this is mm -hmm. what I think mm -hmm. is important about Gordon's work. These photographs, and I think that when he found these photographs, that he 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 sort of arrived at, at something in his own mind. Um, you know, the bits of the sprockets, et cetera, mm -hmm. and so forth, being left in there, et cetera, mm -hmm. and so forth. They are, in the same sense, related to the cuts. To the cuts. Because right. they are sort of, you know, letting light through the darkness, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, but if you, if you look at this one here, as example, you know, it's the same kind of concept as, as a pinhole camera. You take a dark room and you let some light in by opening, by making an opening, and that's what a camera does. And in the long run, I think that once Gordon discovered photography, that he sort of, he saw what every good photographer sees, which is that it's simply about letting light in. It's always about that. And so if you imagine this room without that cut, you wouldn't be able to see it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have this picture because it's the light that lets you see it. In this mm -hmm. picture, it looks like nothing. It looks like somebody just put a black thing on, on the end right. of the building. Well, you can't really <laughs> yeah. even tell that it's a cut. Yeah, it could be a painting, it could, yeah, be, it could be anything. But here, right. mm -hmm. you see that it's definitely letting light in. And because it is letting light in, the light 
completely commands the space. The light mm -hmm. completely designates what the space is and articulates what's going on in the space. So the light becomes the image. As anybody right. who takes photographs knows that you're not photographing a thing, you're photographing light on a thing. And, and mm -hmm. I think uh, that uh, light is uh, one of the main tools of the architect. So it's, it could be one entrance uh, uh, to, to think about the, the fact that architect could have been influenced because he has critical buildings with not enough light. He said, we open more the, the, the buildings and, and, and to bring lights into the architecture. That could be also one of the connections. your idea. I don't know if it's his idea. What we know about Gordon is he studied architecture. He never became an architect. And as I told you before, Turner, the classic painter, studied architecture. And, you know, if you look at Turner's paintings, you could see that really, uh, are they about those kind of mystic images uh, on the sea? They're about light. Absolutely. Okay? Uh, well, they're probably about a lot more things than that. But, you know, in a certain kind of way, uh, you might say this has something to do with architecture, but what it says to me more than this has something to do with architecture is I am not an architect. Okay. Mm -hmm. That if I had to put a sentence on it, that's the sentence mm -hmm. I would put on it. Mm -hmm. I am not an architect. So he, he's okay. a sculptor. No, I cut up architecture. Mm -hmm. So if I see architecture, I cut it in half. Okay. So I don't not, like not architecture because I am not an architect. I am a cutter up of architecture. So and architecture means it's a, an anagram between architecture and uh, anarchy, architecture and anarchy. And, you know, I used to be, you, you may not know this, the, the vice president of the Architecture League of New York. Mm, okay. Right. Okay? Yeah. And um, I knew a lot of architects, um, particularly friendly with Ulrich Franzen, I knew him quite well. And the fact of the matter is, is that architects are highly critical of architecture, most of them, okay? And the, the fact of the matter is, is that there are always a certain number of people, particularly today, operating within architecture that are not, in the truest sense, architects. They are people who say that the social conditions are the architecture. They are people who say that the flow of traffic is the architecture. They are people who have all these kinds of conceptual ideas in relationship to what architecture is as a, a metaphor for how we live our lives, as example. So, this is a trend that's always existed in architecture. You have those people like, you know, Cone, Pedersen, Fox, and those kinds of firms who put up big skyscrapers. You don't have to, they don't have to do much thinking because they're putting this thing up. They just have to make sure that it'll stand up when they get it up, okay? Whereas they're fully aware of these other people like, Archie Graham and other people like that who have all these theories about what architecture is doing to society or how it's affecting society in one way or another. But somehow or another, all of these people who have all these ideas never get anything done. You know? I mean, they That's never right. actually produce much of anything. I mean, Archie Graham is a perfect example. Whereas uh, architecture students continually sort of uh, quote them and look at what they've, uh, theories they've had and little designs they've made, but where are their buildings? The, the, in, in, the, in the other you know, architect in France, 
There, there are no like, buildings. Like uh, I mean, Rogers and uh, Piano have been influenced by uh, Peter yeah. Cook and all the architect Graham theory. Well, Peter, Peter uh, Cook is, is Archie Graham. But yeah, yeah, the, no. the, the thing is that it may be that, uh, you know, the word conceptual, as, you know, which was started by conceptual art, et cetera and so forth, when it goes into conceptual architecture, that it really doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because architecture has to be something that you can live in. It has to be something that you can work in or it has to be something that has a function or purpose. I mean, unfunctional architecture, theoretical architecture, is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of hard to make it work. And, you know, it's, it's hard to know what kind of contribution it finally makes to architecture. It does make some, because it does make people think that in some way or another they should think about these issues when they build buildings. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, the architects that are known are the ones that put the buildings up. Gordon has uh, made a, a kind of a play word about uh Uh, the sentence form follow function and uh, it says uh, form follow function follow function mm -hmm. so it, in a way it's, it's, it goes to, to your to your ideas that uh, architecture has to to make people living in mm -hmm. and uh, this sentence is kind of a critique of the modernist modernism movement of architecture well If you look at the photographs or you look at anything like that, you see that the reason that this work succeeds in the long run is because it has that kind of idea that existed in the Bauhaus, it existed in the Renaissance, it existed in all of these various periods throughout art history, which is light and dark. Mm -hmm. contrast, uh, juxtapose dark with light. These are ideas that were used as far back as Caravaggio. Do you see it as a public art? No. I see it as art in the public, mm -hmm. which is different than public yeah. art. Mm -hmm. Okay? I think that public art, per se, has to uh, m m be in some way referent to what the public is concerned with or what okay. public issues are about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's different than, let's say, um, plain old sort of what we've come to know as plunk down sculpture, whereas you put a, you put a, a sculpture in front of a building and this is supposed to be uh, a highly aesthetic thing, but the main effect it has in the 21st century is that it makes you think that these people have money to waste or they want to represent their importance or something like that. But it doesn't represent anything to the public, mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. Or the other choice is, mm -hmm. with that kind of sculpture, is there's a big one here, there's a small one somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Art in public is not public art, necessarily. So what about social sculpture? You have to ask Joseph Boys if you can, <laughs> if you can get yourself reincarnated. He's the man for that question. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this is Conical Intersect from uh, 75 mm -hmm. in Paris. And so you, you told us um, that these photographs are the most uh, important aspect of Gordon's work? Absolutely. I still believe that. Mm -hmm. And even looking at this one here, I'm more convinced of it. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the piece of red tape at the mm -hmm. top, mm -hmm. etc. Et It's almost like he's doing what painters do when they put, you know, brush strokes across mm -hmm. the top mm -hmm. of something. Uh, Another thing that one can say about those kinds of images is that this kind of piece 
reminds me a lot of Robert Rauschenberg. Yeah, me too, when I you saw know? it, yeah, right. And, yeah. and Gordon, of course, and myself, we, we both knew Robert Rauschenberg quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Rauschenberg had a loft on Lafayette Street, and we used to go over there and hang out. You know, there's always this kind of issue in photography of what should be photographed. What should I point the camera at? What, how do I make a photograph? Well, here, you know, you have it all. You have the light and dark. You have the effect that f photography can do. You have the, the changing and the aesthetic issues, etc. and so forth. So, from my point of view, if somebody would say to you, uh, here, you can have anything you want in this exhibition. I would take this. Okay. Do you think it's a, a, a documentary photograph? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I think that there is an element of documentary in it, but the photograph stands as itself, in my opinion, because the photograph is not just a document. Mm -hmm. He's using the photograph to, to make a whole kind of, you know, idea of you know, a photograph. I was with Gordon when he made these. Mm -hmm. And he talked to me a lot about them. And he had a lot of hesitation as to whether he should do it or not. Uh, because he, he felt that the action was important. But then, after a certain amount of time, he actually became good at this. He actually sort of knew what to do with it. You know? And on top of all that, it was a way of him helping these activities to last throughout history or through time or however you want to say that. And so he wasn't just satisfied with the idea of taking a photograph of the thing and saying, here, this shows that it happened as you take a photograph into a courtroom and you say, here, he was stabbed in the back, look. You know, th this is not just a photograph of the activity. This is a series of slides turned into an entire art wor artwork in its own right, mm -hmm. okay? This is not just a documentation okay. mm -hmm. by any means. For me, it, it, it could represent also uh, an apartment plan the corridor and different uh, 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 for you that's okay for you you're your own man <laughs> Gordon was sort of like pulled between two things he wanted to document the work he wanted the work to last after he had ceased to last but he also wanted these things to hold up as artworks he wanted there to be some sort of aesthetic that he was uh, presenting. And if you look at these photographs in terms of, you know, you juxtapose them with other photographs that people take, they're pretty unique yeah. mm -hmm. in that way. And, uh, they actually uh, look like you never would see one of these anywhere and not know who it is or what it is. Can I ask why is it green here around? I, I don't know why don't it's know. green other than that he he probably uh, made some kind of aesthetic choice. Right. That, that green uh, <clears throat> moves your eye in a certain direction. Okay. But was it and here you have green on the bottom yeah. and you have red on the side. These, you know, I was in the dark room with him when he was making these. These are just pieces of tape that he put on there. Yeah, stabilize the negatives. Yeah, but the, the it, it, I, I have to reiterate you would never see one of these things anywhere amongst a huge photographic exhibition and mistake it for anything else. Yeah. You know? That's unique. That's yes, unique. it's quite unique. Yeah. These, I, I suspect, are reprints from his mm -hmm. thing. I don't think these are photographs that he actually... He may have taken the photographs, but he never printed them. Well, there are two forms of photographs. There are photographs that he took uh, to document the activity, and there are photographs that he made. These are made photographs. 
there's a big difference between mm -hmm. taking a photograph and making a photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, although that may sound like it's a little bit of a play on words, but nevertheless, it is a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and these are the photographs, from my point of view, that actually become, you know, the art. Descending steps for Bataan. Yeah. He has done in, that in 77, and I saw also a picture of his person, and he looked quite well in well, he, But he was sick in 77, uh -huh. that's for sure. Uh -huh. And Bataan, uh, again, you know, I mean, look at these cutoff sprockets, uh, and don't look at the image for a second, and just look at that. Yeah, there's no question that, uh, you know, well, he was pulled between the idea of, you know, this kind of performance art and classic modernism. This is a classic modernist photograph. It's not postmodern mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. All this kind of like aesthetic. Mm -hmm. cutting mm -hmm. and connecting together. Look at mm -hmm. this yellow tape mm -hmm. here, etc. Mm -hmm. So for that is pure modernism. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. performances are postmodern? Modern or postmodern. But I don't think they they relate to modernism in the way this does. Uh, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's an entirely uh, different concern. The performances are not aesthetically based. Okay, they're based in certain kinds of conceptual ideas. Whereas this is definitely has a lot of aesthetic issues involved. And this is, I mean, if you juxtapose this, which is a good thing to do, and I'm surprised the museum hasn't done it, if you put this, or one of those, right next to a piece of graffiti, right next to it, you will see that this is classic modernism. You will see it immediately. I have to explain it to you, but if you put a piece of graffiti next to it, it would just bang up right out at you. So Gordon was very involved in uh, films as well. He has done uh, yeah. a couple of films. Yeah. This is a, a French uh, uh, artist who filmed I know that when the when the art art piece uh, show was on at Cornell University, uh, Gordon was working as an assistant to Dennis Oppenheim. Dennis Oppenheim was doing cuts in the ice. And at that point, you know, uh, none of these works had existed yet. This was 1969. And, and <clears throat> as you may be aware, I, I documented that whole earth art thing. And Gordon was working as an assistant to Dennis doing all that. And somehow or another, I think that that had some kind of influence on him at Dennis's activity of doing this as an art, earth art work, mm -hmm. that he then started doing that kind of thing. Sure. I think it's, it's normal, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, without too much complication, that uh, a person who is doing activities would film them because that's the only way you can get a, a sort of evidence of the activity. Gordon, Dennis, and I were all friends at a certain point. At a certain point, Carol Gooden decided to open food and Tina Gerard and, and Carol Gooden decided to open food. 
and Gordon got a little bit involved in it, but it was mainly Carol Gooden's activity. And it was essentially uh, a kind of a health food restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was one of those kinds of things where we're going to make the world a better place by helping people to eat better. Uh, but as you know, if you've ever been to a health food restaurant, your life is in danger. <laughs> but people have often a asked me, and I think you asked me at some point, what this had to do with Levine's, but Levine's restaurant. But it didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, uh, first of all, Levine's restaurant was already, you know, existed a couple of years before that. And second of all, Levine's was not interested in healthy food. I mean, uh, if anything, I think, you know, it may have been unhealthy to eat at Levine's, but, but it wasn't about food. It was about a concept. Whereas this was kind of like, uh, it was like the way millennials are today. They want everything to be some kind of a, an improvement in the, uh, concept of life they they actually a lot of the things they they do are good they don't want racism they don't want sexism they don't want all these things and a lot of those things are very good but that's what um, food was about it was about sort of like it was at that period where health food stores were just coming into their own in America and Carol Gooden had decided that this was a great idea to, you know, get people to eat grains and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. But Levine's had nothing to do with that. We we weren't interested in in actual food mm -hmm. per se. I mean, but any anyway, at a certain point, uh, Gordon came to me uh, and he said, "I'm I'm not feeling well." But I, I supposed to go to Germany in a couple of weeks, and so I said to him, "Well, wh why don't you go to a doctor and see what he says about it?" And lo and behold, the doctor told him not to go. And this was the beginning of of us realizing that he had pancreatic cancer. And uh, you know, if you think about it too, though, you know, Gordon and Batan were twins, and when Batan jumped out the window, uh, it was only 18 months later that Gordon died. And there are people who believe, uh, and I think to some degree I believe it too, that there is some kind of symbiotic connection between twins. Mm -hmm. that when something bad happens to one, mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. is connected with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. and, so, mm -hmm. and so uh, when, when Batan died, Gordon was completely in a terrible state over this. He was extremely sad. And so, uh, you know, as I told you, I, t mm -hmm. I took him to see Dujan Rinpoche. Uh, and you know that seemed to help a little mm -hmm. bit, but in the long run, I, I, I don't think he ever really got over that aspect of things. And pretty much from that moment on, I think his he he slowed down completely in his work. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, yes. thank you very much, uh, Les, no, for no, this no, interview. No. Thank you. Thank Here at the Jeu de Paume uh, on uh, July 19, 2018. Je ne savais pas exactement comment ça, ça, ça se, se présentera. C'est le même, enfin, c'est assez, assez drôle.